So, welcome everyone to episode 31 of the quantum science seminar. And uh, today we will have Rick uh, de Riedmatten and uh, he will tell us about quantum repeaters. And uh, maybe you wonder not seeing uh, Sebastian announcing today's seminar. And uh, the reason is that he uh, just got father, he just got his first child uh, Christmas uh, uh, last year. And uh, all the organizers, I want to congratulate him basically on behalf of all the organizers. And uh, we are very happy uh, when he's back again. But uh, of course, he should take his time and enjoy the first weeks at home. And um, as usual, in, in the seminar, we uh, encourage all of you to ask questions. And um, that works either via the YouTube live stream or by sending an email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com. And um, I think that's all I should say at the beginning. And now I hand over to Letizia to actually announce uh, Hüg. So uh, happy new year to everyone. So it is my pleasure to introduce Hugues de Riedmatten, uh, the first speaker of season three of the Quantum Science Seminar. That means uh, our first speaker of 2021. So Hugues comes originally from the French speaking part of uh, Switzerland. Uh, he did his bachelor and master's studies in Sion and in Lausanne before moving to Geneva, where he did his uh, PhD thesis in the group of Nicolas Gisin. And he worked there uh, on photonic entanglement and long distance quantum communications in optical fibers. Um, afterwards, he moved to Caltech uh, for a postdoctoral stay in the group of Jeff Kimball, uh, where he expanded his uh, research interests to light matter interfaces between single photons and called atomic ensembles, and uh, worked with the long term goal of creating quantum repeaters for quantum networks. Uh, in, in 2006, he moved back to Geneva, where he co-leaded the activity on storing photonic quantum states in uh, a different platform, solid state atomic ensembles. And since uh, 2010, he's a group leader and an ICREA professor at ICFO in Barcelona. Uh, so he's one of my colleagues uh, there. And his group is the Quantum Photonics with Solids and uh, called Atoms Group and develops quantum memories for quantum communications using very different platforms that you will hear about today in the talk and uh, linking these very different platforms uh, with different uh, quantum light sources. And some of these activities are done within the idea of creating a quantum internet uh, network, let's say, in Europe. For his research, uh, it uh, has uh, received uh, several prizes. In 2011, an ERC starting grant. In uh, 2017, the Experimental Science and Technology Prize of the City of Barcelona, actually. And in 2018, a personal fellowship from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And with this, I give the word to Uc uh, to hear about his quantum memory experiments. Thank you, Leticia. Let me share my screen. OK. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Leticia, for the introduction. And thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak in this very nice uh, quantum seminar series. Um, I will speak today about uh, quantum networks and quantum repeaters. And in particular, we'll speak about our efforts uh, at ICFO to, to, to build quantum nodes for, the, for these quantum repeaters. And you can see here a kind of glimpse of what I will talk about during this uh, next 45 minutes or so. Um, this is a platform where we have, a, for example, a cold atomic ensemble here. In the middle here, you have a, a, a rare earth doped uh, crystal, which we will also use as a quantum memory. And on the right here, you have a, a small nanocrystal doped with rare earth ions uh, inside a fiber based uh, cavity. Okay. I think I will stop sharing because my slide is not moving. Okay. Uh, 
Um, okay, so the long term, let's say the long term um, vision or long term dream of in this field is will be to, to, to distribute entanglement within any two points on Earth, or if you want to be a little bit more modest, let's say on the continental scale. And so this would be like the vision of a quantum network. And in this quantum network, you would have typically uh, material quantum nodes which are a material system where we can, we can uh, store and process quantum information. And these nodes would be linked by uh, optical fibers where we would send photon to distribute now quantum resources and quantum entanglement, for example, between, between the nodes. Um, so if we were able to do that, uh, uh, there would be a lot of applications that, that, could, that we could uh, envision. Uh, some of them quite well known, like, like secure communication using quantum key distribution, for example. But also other ones a little bit more futuristic, like distributed uh, quantum computing, co linking quantum computers together, or, or, or making um, secure quantum computing in the cloud, for example. And there have been even other proposals uh, where we could use this quantum network to do, for example, uh, enhanced clock synchronization. So if we look at, for example, one of these uh, link that we have now, let's say two nodes that we separated, for example, by a thousand kilometers or so, um, and we would like to distribute now entanglement between, between these nodes. Of course, it's impossible to just send a photon down this, this link. Uh, so one thing we could do is to use, for example, satellites. And there was actually a lot of very impressive work done with the, with the Chinese satellite Nisius recently. Um, but what we are interested in actually uh, in our group is to, to stay on Earth and to, to do that with uh, what we call quantum repeaters. So the, the, the idea of the quantum repeater is to now to, to split the total distance between here Alice and, and David into several links. Um, and um, I, I draw here two links, but there could be actually um, more links. And then you want to distribute entanglement within each of these links in an, in, in an independent way, in, independent way, sorry. So to be independent, these links now, what we should do is to store the entanglement uh, in, in a quantum memory, actually, such that, that when we know that when the link is entangled, we can wait for the other links to, to also be entangled. When two neighboring links are entangled, what we'll do is a joint measurement now in, in the middle here between, between Bob and Chloe uh, to make a Bell state measurement, which is, means that this will uh, actually teleport the entanglement now uh, to the outer nodes between Alice and, and, and David. What we need to make such a quantum repeater working is we need to have heralded entanglement. So it's very important that we know when the initial link is entangled. And we need to store this entanglement into a, to a quantum a quantum memory. So this, this, um, uh, this type of repeater is based on, on heralded entanglement. Uh, there have been already actually other type of, of repeaters that have been proposed that I will not talk about today, but just mentioning here. Uh, which are based, for example, on quantum error correction, and, uh, which require, let's say, more advanced capability than, than what, I will, what I will explain today. Okay, so this is the outline of, um, uh, of the talk. So I will first start by introducing quantum repeater nodes. Uh, and then I will go through these three um, uh, type of system that I will want to, to, to explore for making quantum repeater nodes. One is based on, on, uh, on atomic ensembles, uh, which then I will speak about uh, entanglement between solid state quantum memory made of, of crystals. And then in the end, briefly mention uh, this, this, this kind of new option that we are considering of using single rare earth ions in, in solids. Okay, so to make a, a quantum nodes, uh, there are actually several requirements that we, that we should have. The first one, of course, is that uh, we should have an efficient uh, uh, interface between the node, between the material node and, and the photon, uh, and also to have entanglement actually between this node and, and, and this photon. And you would also like to, to store the quantum information for a long time in, in the node. And, and of course, the photon ideally should be a telecom wavelength if we want to send it to, to long distances in optical fibers. But also thing that we will see are very useful is that, that we would like to, to be able to have a node which is not able to not only able to store one qubit, but many qubits. So we like to have a multi-qubit register, and we will see that this is very useful to make efficient entanglement now between between a um, um, long distance node. Um, and finally, the last important point is that we would like ideally to have uh, the ability to do quantum logic between uh, between uh, qubits which are stored locally in, in the node. 
So there have been a, a lot of uh, 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 systems that have been proposed for, for, for nodes. You see here, for, for example, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, for example, things that we talk about today, colotomic gases and rare earth crystals, but also single trapped atoms or ions uh, can, can serve as quantum node or, or color centers in, in, in diamond, for example. And, and we can basically um, um, separate now this, this, uh, this, this, this nodes in two, uh, two big families. One is based on ensembles, um, uh, ensembles of, of, of emitters or, or atoms. And uh, the nice point about this is that um, you have a very easy and collective uh, and efficient light matter interaction without the need of a, of a fiber-based, um, uh, of, of a high finesse cavity, sorry. And in that case, uh, the, um, the, the qubits are stored as under the form of a collective uh, spin excitation or collective atomic excitation that you can, that you can see here, where well, you have one atom excited, but the excitation is delocalized now between all, all the atoms. And this has a nice point uh, because this kind of, of, of quantum, quantum object can be very efficiently converted into a single photon by a, a collective uh, enhancement uh, of, the, of the light matter interaction. And then another advantage of, of atomic ensemble is that uh, uh, because you have many, many, uh, many atoms, you can, you can in principle multiplex quantum information. So you are able to now to, to store multiple qubits in, in multiple degrees of freedom inside, inside this ensemble. And the, the, the other approach is, is based actually on single emitters. Um, and now these this single emitters could be, for example, yeah, trapped ions or, or atoms, as I said, or core centers. Um, and the nice point is that now you are able to have, in principle, strong interaction between qubits. You can do quantum logic between these, 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 these quantum, uh, quantum emitters. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want to have, um, um, let's say, efficient interaction between the photon and, uh, and, uh, and the, the atom, you need to have an optical cavity. So we see that we have this type of very different type of nodes, which have very different capabilities. And so this, this actually calls for, for trying to try to make a, a heterogeneous network with different nodes combining all these capabilities. And uh, we have done a first step actually in this direction a couple of years ago, where we have been able to, 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 uh, to make quantum communication to exchange qubits between two very different platforms. One is a cold atomic ensemble and, and one is, is a the dope crystal. So we emitted the qubit from the cold atomic ensemble, we frequency converted it and, and, and absorb it into, into the doped uh, crystal. So this was kind of proof of principle that we can in principle do really quantum communication between these disparate uh, quantum nodes. Okay, if we go a little bit more now into the, 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 the details of the performance that we would need uh, to, to what we would need to really build a quantum repeater. So first of all, we need indeed a quantum memory. And uh, we would like to have an efficiency of storage and retrieval efficiency, ideally well above 90%. Uh, the storage time depends a little bit on, on the, the type of uh, architecture that we use, uh, but we can say something like five, between 500 microseconds and 500 milliseconds, a few hundred milliseconds would be, would be good. And ideally you would be able to store um, above a thousand modes if you really want to be, uh, to be efficient. And then the other thing you need is a, a memory compatible entanglement source. And for this, there are basically two approaches. Uh, one is to, uh, to separate, let's say, the entanglement creation and the entanglement storage. So you have a source generating now a pair of photon. And you take one of these photon and you store it into your quantum memory. And the other photon, uh, which could be then a telecom wavelength, uh, is sent in the fiber wide uh, far away. This is what we call a read, write, or, or absorptive quantum memory. There is also another possibility, which is to use now an, an, an emissive quantum memory, where now you excite your quantum memory with a, a classical pulse, and uh, the quantum memory will emit a photon uh, entangled with the memory. And, and, and now, so you basically you have in the same system, you have the entanglement creation and, and storage. Because most of the quantum memory we use are not at telecom wavelength, in that case, you would need to have a frequency conversion uh, stage to be able to, to, to have entanglement between telecom photon and, and the quantum memory. So, so far, actually, most of the, of the, uh, the experiment that have been done uh, have used probabilistic sources. 
Um, and actually, a big challenge currently is to try to move also now to, towards deterministic sources to be able to, to, to create deterministically this light matter entanglement. And this is actually a very big challenge. So one thing that we have to do, if you want to build a quantum repeater, is to generate now entanglements between, uh, between two memories. And this is something I will, I will show you how to do in, in the next slides. Um, one thing you could do to create entanglement now is that imagine that you have two sources of, of, of entanglement and two quantum memories here as, as, as node. And, and with this first source, you will um, basically, you will pump these two sources um, uh, coherently with the same pump and you will create a state where you create a photon pair and coherent superposition of, of having these, these, these two sources here. And now one of these photon you will store it into the quantum memory and the other photon you will send it into uh, an optical fiber. Um, and um, then you will combine them uh, at a central location where you have this bin splitter. And the role of this bin splitter is basically to erase the information about the origin of the photon, such that if you have a click now in this photon detector after the bin splitter, you will have no way to know if the photons are indistinguishable, uh, if the photon came from the left, from source A, or from the right, from source B. And this now will basically uh, herald uh, the entanglement of these two quantum memory where you have one excitation stored in memory A and zero in memory B uh, in coherent superposition with the, with the other way around. You can see here actually now that you have a phase here, this phase is important between the two terms. This phase is actually the phase acquired by the single photon on the way from the source to the bin splitter in the middle and you will have to and this phase will, will have to be uh, controlled and, and, and stabilized to, to generate an entangled state. We will come back to this later. The scheme is actually very similar to uh, the well-known DLCZ scheme, but now it has the advantage that we have this wavelength optimization uh, possibility. That's the two photons, that the, the, the two photon doesn't, doesn't have the same uh, wavelength and one photon is resonant with the quantum memory and the, the other photon is a telecom wavelength. So there's one more important point, one more uh, important challenge here is that um, if you want to do such an experiment now with a memory which is able to store only a single mode, and if your memory are very far away, um, well, because you have to, because the entanglement has to be heralded, you have to wait for a long time until the photon uh, arrives from the source until, until the, the, the bin splitter, and then from the information about the click comes back to the memory to tell, okay, now I have entanglement or try again. Um, and so this, if the photons, if the, the memories are far away, can take quite a long time. We, we call this time the communication time. For example, for two memories distant by uh, 100 kilometers, uh, this time, which is L0 divided by C, uh, is about 500 microseconds. So basically this decreases the rate at which we can repeat the experiment uh, to around two, two kilohertz. And so now also if, imagine if we use probabilistic sources and, and we lose a lot of the photons on the way, um, at the end the success probability per trial is, will be very, very low, typically of order of 10 to minus three or 10 to minus four, plus the repetition rate is also very low. So the overall uh, rate to generate entanglement will be uh, extremely low. Now, if you imagine that uh, our memory can store multiple modes, for example, uh, multiple temporal modes, um, in that case, you can make multiple attempts per communication time. And so uh, the, 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 the entanglement probability per communication time will be enhanced by the number of modes that you can store. It will be basically n times the number of modes uh, that you can store. And in principle, if you combine different uh, degrees of, uh, of freedom, for example, frequency, space, or, or, or time, uh, we would like to have uh, a memory that can store up to, up to a bit more than 1,000 modes. And we'll see um, that this is actually possible. So what do we need then if we want to do such an experiment? So we need to have, uh, um, first of all, a long storage time in, in the quantum memory, longer than the communication time, because we would like to keep the entanglement while the photon travel in, in, in the fiber. We'd like to have a photon pair source now with um, um, typically one photon compatible with the memory and one photon at telecom wavelength, being able to store this distinguishable mode and to make a selective readout of, um, of, of the mode as well. 
And of course, to preserve, we need to preserve the face of, of, of each map. Okay, so let me move now to a first uh, system that I want to, 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 to introduce, which is based on, on, on cold atomic ensemble. So this is, I would say, historically one of the first systems that has been considered uh, as quantum memory. And what we will use um, is, a, is an emissive quantum memory based on the, on the DLCZ protocol. And, and the idea is, is, is the following. So we have a rubidium uh, uh, magneto-optical trap uh, with a temperature of about 40 micro Kelvin to a standard atomic an, uh, ensemble. And, and let's say that we have this three level system with two metastable ground state and, and one excited state. First, we send a, a, a right pulse, which is slightly detuned between the G to, to, to E transition. And then, uh, um, Let's say by, by uh, spontaneous Raman scattering, from time to time, you can, you can scatter a photon and, and, and transfer an atom from G to, to S. And this, this will create actually a, a light matter entangled state, which is an entangled two mode squeeze states where uh, you have the probability to, to do nothing. Most of the time you do nothing. And then with a small probability, you create one right photon uh, and uh, one spin excitation in, in the ensemble. So if you now detect uh, this, this, this right photon, you will project your atomic ensemble onto a, a collective spin uh, excitation or, or a spin wave, uh, which, is, which is written here, where again, you have one, one um, atom which is excited, but this excitation is delocalized now between all the atoms. And now you can store uh, uh, this excitation for some time, and then you will, uh, you will uh, send a read pulse, uh, for example, in that case, counter-propagating to the, to the right pulse, and um, by phase matching, then we'll have a collective interference between uh, all the emitters that will remit, help to remit now this photon in one particular direction uh, uh, and to convert this single uh, spin excitation onto a single photon. And this can be done with, with, with high efficiency. So what we really have here actually is, is, is a photon per source, um, but where you have uh, an embedded memory. So one you can store one of the photon onto, onto a, quantum, uh, a quantum memory. So this was uh, actually demonstrated a long time ago, uh, in 2003 or so, uh, in the group of, of uh, Jeff Kimball. Uh, but since then, there had been a lot of progress. Uh, for example, now uh, people have demonstrated quite high efficiency, up to 70, close to 80% uh, readout efficiency, and, and very long storage time also. Uh, around 200 millisecond storage time. Um, people have demonstrated, for example, also this kind of, of, um, of protocol in, uh, in a nanoscale device with atom trapped around the nanofiber, for example. Um, there was some experiment demonstrating also that you can have multiple arrays of this, of this, uh, of this address arrays of this cold atomic ensemble in, in, uh, in MUT and make spatial multiplexing. And finally, there was experiment demonstrating now entanglement between uh, this kind of, of DLCZ, DLCZ memory. This was also first demonstrated in Jeff Kimball's group in 2005, but recently in January Pan's group, they, they have been able to demonstrate entanglement over uh, tens of kilometers of optical fiber, even though the, the memory was still close to each other, but the photons traveled down uh, optical fibers. So there was a lot of experiment, but in all these experiments, um, one, one thing which, is, which was not present is that this, this type of memory are not natively temporal and multimode. So you cannot easily um, use temporal multiplexing with this, with this kind of memory. This is something we wanted to, 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 to try to, to, to study. And so if you want to do this, um, what you need to have is you need to be able to, distinct, to, to create distinguishable uh, spin waves. Uh, distinguishable spin excitation. Uh, for example, create them at different time and, and read them out at different time. Uh, but if you just uh, you have your ensemble, atomic ensemble, you can create them at different times, but when you will read it out, read them out, they will all come out at the same time. So one way to do this is to implement a, a control and reversible inhomogeneous broadening of the spin transition. And this is done by um, using a magnetic field gradient. So we put a magnetic field gradient uh, in, our, in our atomic ensemble. So we create this, uh, in, this inhomogeneous spin broadening. And then we will start uh, sending uh, right pulses to our, to our ensemble. So create excitation at different, different time. 
So when we detect then a, a, a photon, um, the, the, the spins will start to, to, to deface. Um, and then at some point we will just reverse the magnetic field and the spin will now rephase and we will, when the, the spin are in phase again, then we can send the, the, the read pulse and read the particular excitation that, that, that we know was stored at this particular time. So there is, um, this in principle works, works well. There is a, another additional complication is that if you add now many of these uh, right pulses, uh, you will have additional noise, which will be due to uh, um, the, 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 the spin wave that you, created, that you create with these additional pulses and which are defaced by, by the inhomogeneous body. So the solution to this problem is to add a cavity around the ensemble, a low finesse cavity, and then you can have a noise suppression uh, of order of, of, of the, the finesse in, in, your, in your cavity. And we can see here, for example, uh, this is an example of one of the, one of the measurements. Uh, so we store here six, uh, we have here six modes. Um, and what, what we see here is uh, basically it's a, a retrieval with fit forward readout. So we detect a single photon in one particular mode and then we send the read pulse uh, to this uh, to this particular mode as well uh, to detect the single photon. What we see this this, this curve here is now uh, as a function of time, the pulse, the single photon that are read out uh, without the cavity, and we see so there was a particular there was a big noise without the cavity, and when we put the cavity, then we see that this noise is strongly reduced, and this um, also allows us now to demonstrate non-classical correlation between this um, right photon and the spin excitation with a large number of modes. So you see here non-classical correlation, uh, the, the, sorry, the second order cross correlation, uh, G2 right read, which is given by the probability to, to generate a coincidence between the right and the read photon divided by the probability to have a right photon and probability to have a read photon. Um, and what we see again here is the, the without the cavity, you see that this, this cross correlation is very, is very low. And when we have the cavity, it is enhanced uh, uh, by, by, uh, by a lot. And so we can still have significant uh, non classical correlation even for 10 modes. So the number of modes now it, it is a bit limited. Um, um, and the storage time uh, is, uh, is limited by the cavity finesse uh, and by the storage time. But in principle, we could go to up to more than 100 modes. So up to now, I showed that we can uh, we can use this memory as, uh, as a, for, the, for example, multiple memory. Um, but we can also, in principle, use uh, this uh, this uh, this node to as a source of, of single photon. So the idea is the following: if you if you uh, if you generate now a single excitation in, in your in your in your uh, ensemble, then you with this single excitation you can come and, and read it out, and you can shape the the, the read pulse such that you can also shape then the read photon. So you can really create highly tunable uh, read photons. And we see an example here where we are able to, to generate read photons with durations uh, going from tens of nanoseconds up to tens of microseconds. And you have really this large tunability of more than three orders of magnitude uh, to, 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 to generate the bandwidth of this, of this read photon. So it's really a source of, 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 uh, of highly tunable single photon. And then we can also if we, for example, make uh, uh, a read pulse with, with exotic shape, we can also create single photon, for example, with this uh, rising exponential uh, shape. Or if you come with two different pulses, you can have this time beam shape, let's say, you can create time beam. But in general, with this kind of DLCZ source, uh, there is one big drawback. And this big drawback is that we, it is probabilistic source. So we, we generate these two modes squeeze state, uh, but if we want to increase now the efficiency, the, 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 the excitation probability, uh, you will start to excite more and more atoms and you will create uh, two pairs and three pairs uh, uh, of, um, in, in the ensemble. And these pairs will actually be a, a problem when we want to, to build a quantum repeater with this because they will limit the, uh, the fidelity of, of, the, of uh, the, the correlations and the fidelity of the entanglement ultimately. So one thing we could do to get, uh, to get rid of that is to, um, for example, to, to, to use uh, read state to try to generate now 
deterministic or rather quasi-deterministic uh, uh, quantum light. So this was actually discussed uh, in one of the uh, recent seminars by, uh, by Charles Adams. Uh, and the idea is that um, if you have uh, now you, in your atomic ensemble, you have uh, an excited uh, Rydberg state, a very excited, highly excited Rydberg state. For example, in our case, we go to L equal 90. And you, you do an off resonant excitation, so you have a probe. And, and then you have this, this, com this coupling being here that, that takes the atom up to the Rydberg state. And now in the Rydberg state, you have an effect, uh, which is called a Rydberg blockade, which prevents the excitation of, of more than, 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 than one collective excitation within, within a sphere uh, of radius that we call the, 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 the blockade radius. And so if you are able now to, to have a, a, an ensemble which is dense enough and, and small enough, uh, smaller than the blockade, the blockade radius, you can in principle generate only one a collective excitation, even though you have many atoms. And then this collective excitation can be used as a source for generating a single photon. And so this is, uh, this is what we do here. Uh, so you can see here, this is the, 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 the probe pulse. So this is the weak, weak coherent state that we have here at, at the input. And then we generate uh, some, some, some single photon. We store it for, for a few hundred nanoseconds in the, in the, the Rydberg state, and we generate now a single, a single photon. Um, so this light is actually nicely um, uh, anti-bunched, so you can see that the probability of generating two photons uh, in the same pulse is much lower than the probability of generating two photons in, in different pulses. And we can measure now the, 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 the autocorrelation of, of, of this field, and, and we have uh, something which is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, so which shows that we really, really have a, a single photon. So what we were also interested to, to do, interested to do, is to, to check now that the single photon uh, uh, is uh, indistinguishable. So we saw before that it's very important if we want to, for example, to untangle two nodes to generate indistinguishable photons. And for this, we did an experiment where we combine now this single photon with a weak coherent state, with a big speaker, and we made a hongo mandel uh, interference. And so if the two photons now are, are completely indistinguishable, they will exit uh, the, the, um, the, the beam splitter in one of the, one of the two outputs. They will bunch and exit the beam splitter at one of the two outputs. And um, so this is, the, the, we, we did this ex experiment and we could show that actually the single photon is quite indistinguishable. So you can see here, we measure the indistinguishability as a function of the gate duration, that, that is the gate duration, uh, the detection gate um, duration, let's say. And when, if we have a gate of 500 nanoseconds, we take more or less a full pulse. We have indistinguishability above 90%. And it, close, it comes very close to one if we now decrease our, uh, um, our gate. So the, the photons that actually we generate here, um, you can see, I mean, we have a, a G2 of 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So there's still a significant um, two photon uh, com component. Uh, but there have been actually a lot of experiments recently, in particular one uh, by JQI, where they were able to show that really this two photon component can go down to, to almost 10 to minus four. So by actually by increasing the Rydberg number up to 140, they could really uh, create an almost perfect single photon. So I think it is really a, a, an interesting um, way forward to generate this kind of uh, deterministic or quasi-deterministic light matter uh, entangled state. Okay, so I think now it's a natural, uh, uh, perhaps natural uh, time to, to see if, you, if there are already some questions before I start to, to speak about the second part of the talk and, and about solid state quantum numbers. Thank you, Hugo. Um, yes, we do have um, a few questions and I, I guess I'll start with something more basic. So perhaps I'll take you back to the um, the heralded entanglement generation, this, the scheme with the two SPDC sources. Um, so the question is, are, are the photons entangled in the number bases? And more generally, is it already known what bases will be optimized for a network, for a real life network, polarization or number or dual rail representation? Yeah, so in, in, that, case, in that case, indeed, the photon will be entangled in, in the photon number bases. Um, um, and so, 
the, the, let's say the, the optimal uh, degrees of freedom, uh, this um, the, depends, there, there, are, there are drawbacks and advantages in, in, in the different one. For example, if you use this number, uh, photon number state basis, so you, are, you would have to do bell state measurement with a single click on your detector. And this has the advantage that it's very efficient because you have to trans, trans, to create only a single photon, to transmit a single photon and to detect a single photon. So the, the rate's actually much, much higher than, than using another type of, of uh, bell state measurement with a two photon polarization, for example, if you use polarization, uh, two photon um, uh, coincidence. On the other hand, uh, if you use this, this single click or, or in photon number state, you have to stabilize the phase of the link, which can be um, um, technologically um, um, complicated. But usually, I, I would say probably at the end, the rate will be more important than the, than the technological implication of, of stabilizing the links. And in fact, we, we have shown that we can stabilize the links at least to, to some reasonable distance. Thank you. Um, so we had a uh, few questions about efficiency and storage time, I, and maybe I'll, I'll read uh, two of them together. So you talked about the need of having a storage time longer than the communication time. Uh, what's the state of the heart with that? Uh, will it uh, limit the uh, L, L naught, the, uh, the distance uh, between nodes? Um, another question was, can you have both long storage time and large quantum efficiency in the same setup? And what is the best system that matches these two requirements? Yeah, so that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So I guess yeah, it depends a lot on, on, on the system. So with, with cold atomic ensembles, uh, um, there have been actually in the same system, um, there, there have been, um, let's say, efficiencies of about 70% for short storage time and, and very long storage time up to a few hundred milliseconds demonstrated. So there, uh, I mean, there was this would not limit, I mean, the, the limit to ensemble, let's say, two memories, um, this, this 300 milliseconds correspond to, to I, don't know, I don't know, but more than 1,000 kilometers at least. So this this, um, this will not be a limit per se. But this limit of, of the, let's say, that the storage time has to be longer than the communication time, this is true only for if you have one link. If you have more links, then the, the coherence time should be longer than the time it takes to distribute the entanglement over the four links. Mm -hmm. and this can be, of course, much, much longer. Um, so now, yeah, so in, in cold atomic ensemble, the, there was uh, 300 uh, millisecond, I think has been demonstrated uh, with the uh, solid state quantum memories uh, that I will describe uh, next. It's a, a little bit less for now. We are in the millisecond regime, tens of millisecond regime, uh, but there have been some experiments uh, as I will, I will describe uh, which have stored light classically, at least on the minute or even hour time scale. But regarding then the, 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 the prospect of having everything in the same system, this is actually one of the main challenges that, that we see now to really have long, extremely long storage time and high efficiency in the same system. And so far, uh, let's say in cold atoms, to really have at the same time 300 milliseconds storage time and uh, whatever 90% efficiency, this has not been shown. Each has been shown separately, but not, not, not together. And this is really a big challenge now. Yes. Um, perhaps um, um, the, the last two questions regard uh, how fast the bit rate could be. What, um, what is the fastest rate you could temporarily store photons uh, in the, the multi-mode uh, memory and also in the other memory? Does the cavity help with that? So, um, I guess, yeah, this depends a lot. So I, would, I guess the bit rate would be then to, 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 to generate entanglement between two memories. Or, 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 or in that case, I will show an example also later where we do some entanglement. So we, we can reach, at least on short distance, uh, entanglement, heraldic entanglement rate around kilohertz. Um, this type of, of, of repeaters, let's say, using um, heraldic entanglement. Uh, will at the end be um, limited in, in bit rates over very long distances, uh, just because you have this kind of communication time, which will limit at the end the repetition rate. So let's say over very long distances, over a uh, thousand kilometers or so, um, we would not expect bit rates you know, above, above, a, above a kilohertz. So this would be something already, which would be very high. Um, so then this depends, 
uh, also this depends a lot on this kind of source we use with this kind of uh, the probabilistic sources. Uh, you you have you have this this um, this um, trade off that I was talking about that if you want to increase the bit rate, you want to increase your probability to generate a photon, uh, then you decrease the fidelity. And so this is also not uh, not something that you want to do. So at the end, the bit rate is a bit limited in, in that in that respect. Thanks. I, I think we'll keep the uh, other questions uh, to the end and let you continue. Please. Okay. Okay, so now I will, I will, I will explain a, a different type of system and I will tell you about an experiment where we did entanglement between two uh, solid state quantum memories. So the system that we, we, are, we are using is a rare earth dot crystal. And in this uh, rare earth dot uh, crystal, so these are the lanternites that you, that you see here, the, the, the series. Um, and this is a very nice system because it provides a very large number of uh, stationary atoms. Uh, with optical and spin transitions. We have optical transition to absorb the photon and, and spin transition to, to, to store uh, the, the photon. And um, if you cool them down, so you need to cool them down, say to, to four Kelvin or so, uh, then it has also very good coherence properties. So what we have is this type of, of, of crystal with uh, us doped randomly inside. And so the atoms are you're really stationary, you don't need to, to, to trap them. They are kind of naturally trapped in the, in the crystal. So we call that sometimes a frozen gas. Um, but since we are in the solid, there is uh, actually some inhomogeneous broadening. Um, so each atom sees a slightly different crystal environment. And this now will um, make that each atom has a slightly different resonance frequency. But the nice point is that this uh, inhomogeneous broadening is, is static. And so this means that we will be able to tailor it, to tailor the absorption, and we will use that as a resource for, for multiplexing the time. Um, another interesting point is that it's uh, being a solid state, it's compatible with integrated design, and there are techniques to really make waveguides, for example, waveguide arrays out of this, out of this crystal. And another thing which also be, is quite interesting is that uh, these rare earth ions have a permanent dipole moments, which is different in the ground and excited state. So we can actually have dipolar, dipolar interactions between the ions, and this will become particularly interesting when we look uh, for single ions. So the particular um, um, crystal that we use is the prosodymium doped yttrium autosilicate, and it has the following level structure. You have an optical transition uh, in the orange, the 606 nanometer, and you have three ground state and three excited states uh, in the system. And it's a spin uh, of coherence time is, is about one second. Uh, if you use a, uh, a good magnetic field and the optical coherence time is 150 microsecond. And we like this material because it has a good level structure where we can really uh, store the, the information into a spin wave. And there has been some actually quite good uh, the, um, performances that have been shown with, with uh, classical light, with light storage up to one minute using EIT, and an efficiency up to 70% has been demonstrated uh, also with, with coherent stuff. But it has a drawback that the spacing between these this, this levels here is quite, uh, quite small, and so this limits the bandwidth of, of the memory to, uh, to around four megahertz. So the, the, the protocol that we use to store now um, um, quantum light into, into our memory is uh, so-called the atomic frequency count protocol. And the idea is the following. Uh, let's imagine that you have uh, for now a two level system, uh, which is inhomogeneously broadened. So you want to send now a single photon to uh, resonant with this with the transition from G2 to E. And if you do this, you will then create a, a collective excitation of, of these ions. Um, but because you, know, you have inhomogeneous broadening, uh, this, this excitation will, 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 uh, will then dephase. Uh, the, the, each time of this phase of this sum will acquire a different phase and, and the excitation will dephase and they will lose the photon. But imagine now that you are able to, uh, to make a, a series of um, very narrow and, and, and periodic absorbing peaks within this structure. And we can do that. Um, um, in that case, uh, at some point, the, because of the periodic structure, there would be a rephasing of all the dipoles. And when there is this rephasing, then we will remit the photon in the forward direction. So this is really like a collective coherent emission in the forward, uh, the forward uh, emission. 
And the storage time now depends on the spacing between the teeth if in this in this context. We call that an atomic protocol. And the really nice uh, thing about this protocol is that now, um, if you start, if you come with a, a train of single photons, um, this uh, photon will be stored at create excitation at different time, and then they will rephase also at different time. So you can uh, really have a train of single photon at, at the at the output. So this is let's say natively temporarily uh, multi-mode. Yeah, you can see here an example of uh, one of the atomic frequency counts. So what you see here is the optical depth uh, of, 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 uh, of the crystal, the function of frequency. And we are able to, to make, uh, for example, in that case, this would be for um, a storage time of two microsecond. And this would be typically the, the, the spectrum of the photon that, that, that we store here. So now, up to now, this was only a kind of delay that we um, um, that we did. So the, the photon is, is stored in the crystal and re-emitted passively after some some predetermined delay. Um, if we want to to um, have a so-called on-demand readout, what we can do is to to transfer now with the control pulse uh, the optical excitation into a spin excitation. Um, and then we store it in the spin state for, for some time, and then uh, we, we come up, we come back up with another control pulse, um, and, and then the photon will be now remitted on this E to, to, to G transition. So this is what we call spin wave uh, storage, and this provides now on-demand readout. We can read out when we want, um, and also it provides um, you know, much longer storage time because we can take advantage of the storage time of, of the spin state. This was actually demonstrated for the for the first time uh, at single photon level uh, in 2015 at ICFO and, and, and also in, in Geneva. Okay, so now we have a memory, uh, but if we want to make entanglement, we, we need also a um, um, uh, source of entanglement. And for this uh, for this experiment, we use a down conversion source. Um, and so the problem with down conversion is that um, you the photon that you will create, so we, we have a pump, at, uh, in that case, 426 nanometer, which create two photons, uh, one at 1436 and one at 606. And the photons that you create are very broadband, usually hundreds of gigahertz. So what we need to do, uh, because we need a very narrow band single photon in our case, is to embed it into a cavity. So we embed this into, a, in, into an optical cavity with a finesse of around 150. And then the probability to create a pair um, um, Per is enhanced, let's say, uh, uh, in the cavity mode by a factor of f square, where f is a finesse um, of the cavity. And so, in that case, we are able to now to generate this pair of photons widely non-degenerate with a with a spec with a spectrum of around two megahertz. Um, so, the spectrum. If you look a bit more to the spectrum that we have, uh, we have let's say um, two wavelengths. And so each wavelength will see a slightly different free, free spectral range. And so at the end, the spectrum that we will, we will generate is, is something like this. We have this around 15 modes uh, separated by uh, the free spectral range, 261 um, megahertz in our case, and with a, with a line width of around 1.8 megahertz. Now let's see how we can store that into, into, into the photon. So we have into the memory, sorry. We have the photon pulses. We have this telecom photon that we use as a herald. And then we, the heralded single photon will be now stored into, into, the, into the quantum memory. And what you see here is a time histogram of this. So this is the input now. And this is when we have just the atomic frequency count. So we just saw here in the excited state. And now when we put the two control pulse, uh, we will have now this so-called spin wave echo, which uh, is now also can be read out on, on demand. Um, we also showed actually that now we have, we are able to also not to, to only to generate this single photon, but also to demonstrate non-classical correlation between the telecom photon and, and, the, and the, 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 the spin excitation stored in, in, in the memory. And so what we have now is then quantum correlation between a single telecom photon and a spin wave. And so we have, in that case, prospects for very long storage time. In, in this particular experiment, the storage time was limited to a few tens of microseconds, but we have prospect to go to much longer storage time. Okay, so now 
let's come back to uh, the experiment of entanglement. So now we have everything to show, uh, to show entanglement. So what we need to do now is to double the source and to double the two memories. So now we have two sources and two memories. Uh, we pump them with the same laser, uh, this blue laser, and we have this orange laser here, which is used to lock the two cavities. And then the idler photon is sent into an optical fibers and combined here at the, at the, at the beam splitter, at this central location. Uh, the two memories in our case are in different laboratories and they are separated by about 10 meters. But let's say the full, the full fiber length is around 75, 75 meters. So one thing that we have to do, as I said before, is that we have to control the phase uh, um, in this, in this um, uh, interferometer. So we have here a fiber stretcher to really control and, and stabilize the phase. Um, so what do we need to do if we now want to demonstrate entanglement? So we have a click here that tells tells us in principle, we have entanglement now in our memories. So how, how, do we, how do we show it? So we need two different things. We need first to show that we are in the single excitation regime, meaning that we, we create only one photon, which is stored in, the, in the, two, um, uh, the two memories. And we need to show that we have a coherent superposition. So ideally we would like to have one collective uh, excitation shared between these two crystals, which are separated by 10 meters. So for this, we can either directly read out the memory and detect the photon to measure uh, the statistics, or we can recombine, let's say, the two modes at the output of the memory, again with a with a with a fiber, and uh, recombine them to to look at the coherence of opposition. So this is what this is what we what we do. Then we recombine them, and 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 we can see here that um, we look at the coincidences now between the two photons the Herat photon and the photon stored and retrieved in the both memories. And we do have indeed a coherence of opposition uh, between, between the two, which means that we really, really have uh, this coherence of opposition between two single collective excitations in, in, in these two, two memories uh, separated in that case by, by 10 meters. We also show that we have a high uh, single photon purity, uh, meaning that, we, uh, that the two photon Two excitation component, let's say, is, is, is uh, below four percent, and um, with this we can now rec reconstruct a density matrix uh, and make by quantum state tomography, and with the density matrix we can show that uh, we actually have a concurrence which is non-negative, non which is let's say, strictly larger than zero, uh, which means that we now have entanglement stored in these in these two crystals. So what we see here actually is. If we look at this, uh, at this, this density matrix, we see that there is a very large uh, zero, zero contribution. And this means that a condition on a herald, we, we have no uh, um, excitation stored in the memory, or we don't detect at least an excitation uh, in, in, from, from the memory. And so a large part of, of this, of this P00 term, uh, is actually due to the loss that we have in between the memory and, and um, uh, and the detectors. Um, and if we correct for this, we basically have in the crystal, we have a concurrence now of, of almost 10 to minus one. Um, and then the rest of the, of, 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 um, uh, of why this is not 100%, let's say, is the loss uh, in, the, in the heralding of the, of the source and also the non-perfect non visibility. Something I want to point out here is this heralding rate, which is actually, uh, that I was mentioning before, it's actually quite high, it's about 1.4 kilohertz. Um, so we herald with 1.4 kilohertz, the presence of entanglement in, this, in these two memories. And this is actually much larger than, than other experiments using long, um, long lived memories. Uh, okay, let me, let me just come back. So here actually, this, this experiment was done with a two microsecond uh, storage time in excited states. So now we are not doing spin wave here, we're doing just excited state storage. Uh, if we want to go to longer storage time, um, we, we also tried this, um, it's just again, only in excited states. Um, we have been able to show that we can have entanglement up to 25 microseconds, uh, when we keep actually rather good visibility. So the, the, the concurrence now decreases because we lose efficiency in the memory, but um, so we still we are still uh, able to have a non-zero non concurrence. 
So this would allow now um, entanglement over, over five kilometers of, of, of fiber in, in, in principle. And if we want to go much longer, then we would need to have uh, spin wave storage. Okay. How, how, how long could it be actually the, 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 this, this, this storage time in, in, in the quantum memory? So I mentioned this experiment before using classical pulses, people have been able to show that you, you, you can go up to uh, almost up to one minute in, in the same crystal that we use. Um, and using another crystal, actually a European uh, yttrium silicate, um, people have been able to show that you can have up to six hours uh, spin coherence. And very recently there was this, this um, impressive results um, by the Hefe group where they have been able to show that you can store light for up to one hour coherently in, in, in this crystal. So now, of course, this is still classical uh, and it's by far not trivial to really go to single photon level because you need to, to be able to do um, this long, long leaf storage without adding noise and this would be very challenging. Actually at the quantum level, uh, in this crystal, the, the longest, I think, published data is uh, about one millisecond storage time for single photons. This was done in Geneva. Um, and, and I think now they have unpublished results where they, they go to, to, to 20 milliseconds. Okay. I um, talked about multimode uh, entanglement before, and our experiments also allows us to test actually this, this multimode uh, capability. So what we will do here is that we will try to simulate uh, a communication time of 25 microseconds. So we, we, have, we simulate that we have two memories far away. Um, in fact, the, 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 the real distance is, 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 uh, is still this 10 meters, but we simulate that we have uh, these memories far away. And in this 25 microsecond communication time, uh, we, can we can fit up to 62 temporal modes. And then what you see here is that we look at the number of temporal modes, uh, at the con concurrence and the heralding rate at the number of temporal modes. And what we see is that the concurrence as we increase the number of modes remains mostly constant, but the heralding rate now increases linearly with the number of temporal modes. So this is really an effect of this uh, temporal multimodality, uh, which show that really it, it will uh, indeed really help to, to be able to store this, uh, this many modes. Okay, so um, we have 62 modes, but we would need to have much more modes than this in principle. So can, can we really increase the number of modes? Or well, temporally, at least it will be a bit uh, difficult, challenging with our, with our crystal. But what we could do is to try to use another degree of free. So I remind you that the photon that we, that we have had this, this kind of spectrum. And usually we, we were selecting only a central uh, mode of the spectrum and, and, and we were storing it into a single uh, atomic frequency count. But what we can also do is to take advantage now of the inhomogeneous broadening of, of, of our crystal and to make in parallel in frequency uh, not one, uh, one memory, but two, in that case, we had 15 quantum memories in, in, in frequency in parallel. And in that case, uh, we would be able then to store the, multi, the multiple modes. And this is what we, what we do here. Uh, we have, um, this is, let's say this, in red, we have the spectrum of, of the single photon. And in orange, we have the, the retrieved pulse from, from the quantum memory. From, in that case, it was again, uh, um, um, excited state quantum memory. And so this one, we have a single mode. Of course, we burn only one memory, but now if we are able to make these 15 memories, uh, we see that at the output, we have indeed these this, this 15 modes, which are, which are, which are re-emitted. So it was indeed 50 frequency modes together combined in that particular experiment with nine temporal modes. So we have been able to then to, 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 to do uh, 135 modes stored in, the, in, this, in this crystal. But if we can, let's, let's dream a little bit and see how, how we can really try to push that even more. Um, so one thing we could, we could do, let's say we could combine now different degrees of freedom. So we have, let's say, imagine 20 temporal modes, 20 frequency modes. And for example, we could use also spatial modes. So 100 spatial mode would be, you know, arrays of 10 by 10, which is something which is uh, easily doable. So altogether, we would have 
almost 40,000 modes in, in that, in that, um, uh, in that crystals, so which would really then boost the, uh, the bit rate for entanglement generation by, by, by a lot. Okay, um, I think I almost used up my time. Um, I wanted to, maybe I would just briefly uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, in the two, two three minutes left, uh, tell you about um, this, this other um, uh, approach that we, we, we have been using. So up to now I spoke about using um, uh, you know, ensemble of, of atoms. So this is, as we show, as we saw, very good for multiplexing, but it has very limited quantum processing capabilities. So what we would like to do now is to, to move to a single rare earth ions. Um, in that case, this would allow the possibility to have long-lived spin photon interfaces and, and to use these permanent dipole moments to, to be able to make quantum gates between, between the ions. And a nice point about the rare earth for doing this is that the coherence is quite well preserved in, in the nanostructure. Um, the problem is, uh, however, that uh, we have a very weak optical transition. And so the, 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 the photon that we generate are, are, are very long. And so it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to detect them. So we need for that to, to, to put actually the, the, the emitter into, into a cavity and to have a strong then per cell enhancement. So in the case, you will, um, you will um, make the emission much faster uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, you will also collect all the emission into, into the cavity mode, uh, which would help to detect non single ions. So this has been actually done by, um, um, by, by two groups, uh, by, um, for example, um, the Thompson group at Princeton, they have been able to show, to detect single erbium ion um, in, in, a, in a silicon photonic crystal, um, and they have shown really um, impressive cell enhancement. And also the Farron group um, uh, at Caltech has been able to show that you have really um, almost um, transform limited photons system. So this, these are actually done with um, nano and macro structured cavity emitters, um, and which are very nice because they are very stable, but on the other hand, they are not uh, easily tunable. So we are interested in another approach, uh, which is to use an, an open cavity um, approach. And the approach is then the following. We, we uh, have nano crystals doped with rare earth ions. And we uh, spin code this nanocrystal on, on a mirror, on a plane mirror, and we come with a fiber cavity um, very close to, 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 the, to the surface. And in our case, we use Erbium, which has an emission at, at telecom wavelength. And, um, and then, so the cavity that, that we had had a, a finesse of around 20,000. And so we could, could reach, uh, let's say, a uh, um, um, personal enhancement of around 200 in, in the and the cavity was locked then in the cryostat. It's a, it's a challenging task to do, but now we're able to, to, to do this. So we are able now to, to detect basically a light from in, coming out of this uh, nanocrystal. So you see um, in green here, you see that the, the, the lifetime count of the function of time uh, of, of the light outside the cavity, of the emitter outside the cavity. And here it's within, with inside the cavity. So we have been able to show that we have strong uh, personal enhancement uh, in that case. So a reduction of the lifetime from, from 11 micro milliseconds to, to 740 microseconds. So in that case, we have shown that actually 10% of the ions in these small ensembles in, in the nanocrystal sees a uh, personal enhancement larger than 70, 72. And this, um, what the interesting point now about, about having this, this kind of tunable cavity is that we can really um, put the cavity on and off resonance fast, much faster than the emission rate, uh, the, the spontaneous emission rate. So what we, what we see here is that we, here we put, for example, the cavity on resonance, and then by slightly tuning the piezo uh, of, 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 uh, of, of the fiber, we can very fast uh, put it off resonance and then very fast put it on resonance again, and we do this, uh, can do this a couple of times. So we can really control now the spontaneous emission 
and, and the person enhanced spontaneous emission with a rate which is 100 times faster than the spontaneous emission rate. This was still done with small ensembles of, of tens of ions. Now we are trying to, to detect really single ion out of this system. Okay, so let me um, now conclude. So I told you about three different ways of, of, of making and uh, trying to make um, quantum repeater nodes. Uh, one is uh, atomic gases. These actually are really probably the most mature now um, uh, type of quantum memory. Um, they have excellent quantum memories and, and the very interesting point is that they have this probability for, for using quantum processing and, and deterministic operations using Wittberg uh, excitation. Um, then solid state quantum memory. So it's a, we saw that it's a, it's a, it's a well-established excellent multi-mode uh, quantum memory. And so we have demonstrated that now we can do uh, heralded entanglement between these memories with, uh, with photon and telecom uh, wavelengths. And of course, we need to improve all the performances. Uh, at this point, they are still too low, but our goal now is really to try to, to move to large scale, demonstration of large scale uh, network outside the laboratory, for example, and, and to move towards the, 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 the demonstration of, of quantum repeaters. Um, and finally, this, this last approach, it's a, um, it's a little bit more um, uh, at the early stage at the moment, but I think it's a very nice system, which will provide uh, you know, a system where you could have, in principle, uh, efficient and coherent spin photon interface, and a large number of, 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 of optically addressable single ion qubits into this nanocrystal. So you could, in principle, have you know hundreds of ions into this nanocrystal where you could make gates between them, and and so this is, I think, is quite also quite exciting for the future that we could we could be able to try to build a network out of this. So before I finish, let me just. Uh, Thanks uh, all my group, um, the present members, and and uh, and, uh, and uh, let's say the recent recent member. So this is a pre-COVID picture, of course, um, of, of of my group. This is actually it's quite old picture by by now, um, but we have also actually um, um, open PhD and, and postdoc positions. So if you are interested, please uh, contact uh, contact me. And yes, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take uh, any, any question. Thank you and congratulations for these uh, very nice results. Thanks for a great talk. Um, so I think I'll pick to uh, maybe on, on the more basic uh, questions. Um, so the first one, the fact that you have a very large uh, P00 component. So which means you have a large vacuum component when you generate those single photons. Does it become a fundamental limitation at some point or is it acceptable as long as the concurrence is positive? So yeah, in, in a repeater architecture, actually this P00 component, um, it will affect the, the rate, uh, but it will not affect the fidelity of the repeater because what we do in a kind of DLCZ um, repeater uh, architecture at the end, we will have um, we will have to let's say to have two chains of this entangled atomic ensemble, and we do some post selection at the end. So we we, we kind of purify somehow the, the this p zero zero term. So it will affect the rate, but it's not a fundamental limitation at this point. So because the fidelity is not compromised compromised by this, actually, if we calculate now the fidelity of our our, our entangled states by removing uh, let's say the, this, this, this P00 component to, to simulate what we would have in a repeater architecture, we, we have a fidelity of about 90%. Mm -hmm. So, in, so in, that, in that case, of course, we would like to have this P00 small uh, because the rate is, is also important, but, but it's not a fundamental limitation. I see. Um, and maybe a last question. You mentioned the possibility of integrating waveguides into solid state quantum memories. Could you explain how this would be implemented and what are the yes. So, but yeah, actually, I didn't have time to to to, to mention this. So, this, yeah, I think it's a very in, interesting um, uh, possibility. So, this is uh, actually uh, we, we do a laser written waveguide. This is uh, actually a collaboration uh, with a group of Roberto Zelame in, in in Milan. So, they, they do the waveguide for us. So, what they do is that they, they shine a, a, a femtosecond laser on this crystal. And this changes uh, slightly the index of refraction in, in, in the crystal, and they can really then make we can really make waveguides out, out of this. 
And so we have shown that the coherence properties are not too much affected by, um, by, by this quite invasive fabrication procedure. And so we can really actually have, um, um, yeah, make waveguides out of this. And now we are working towards trying to make a fiber pigtailed quantum memory out of this. And, and, and the idea would be also to be able to have arrays of this waveguide to, 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 to use that to make spatial multiplexing, for example, or, or to have circuits um, including perhaps other elements like, like detectors or phase shifters or, or uh, yeah, to, 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 to really be able to, to use now the all the integration possibilities to, to using these waveguides. I think yeah, it's a very interesting possibility. Um, thank you, Hugo. Um, so I, I did promise it's the last one, but um, um, we, got, we got another one that uh, seems very interesting. So let me ask this as well. Um, so the, the question is, is the photon number basis, we we'll come back to this uh, issue, used in the crystal crystal entanglement experiment, suitable for quantum key distribution? Since to verify the entanglement, one has to overlap the photons emitted by the two memories in a single location. I wonder if this can be used to distribute separate key. Yeah, so um, two things. So first of all, um, in, in a real repeater, um, or let's say if, you, if, we, if we had memories which were uh, distant, we could not use this trick of recombining um, the two fields to, um, uh, to verify the, the, the coherence, let's say. So there are other, uh, other techniques that have been proposed uh, to, to make uh, local measurements to demonstrate this entanglement. So we would typically uh, uh, use a displacement uh, locally uh, with a local oscillator uh, to, to, to measure the coherence of um, um, let's say of, of the of the of the entanglement of the crystal, so it, it's not fundamental. It's, it's not uh, necessary, let's say, to recombine um, uh, the, the two fields. Um, on the other hand, to make quantum key distribution, um, so you know, with this zero one one zero basis, I think it's not not very not very practical because you to make a quantum key distribution out of this. So. What I would do is to use to use the DLCZ trick and, and, and really to, to double then this, this scheme. Uh, so to have two chains of this of these uh, entangled crystals and then and then to uh, to read them out of the, at, at, at each output to, to create some kind of, of effective polarization entanglement at, at the end to make the quantum key distribution. Mm -hmm. I think that, that would be the way to move. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the rest of the questions we will uh, hand um, to you offline. And with that, I will uh, hand over to Christian uh, for some conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Luke, uh, for the great talk. Um, and I want to remind everyone uh, a little bit on the, the schedule ahead. So uh, next week, we will have Ulrich Schneider from the University of Cambridge speaking about optical quasi crystals quantum simulations beyond periodic systems. So make sure, make sure to check uh, that one out. And uh, the upcoming week, um, we have the second um, version of uh, our young researchers session. And we will have three talks, uh, three shorter talks in a row of uh, three young researchers. So this is also highly uh, recommended uh, to check that out. And um, well, uh, let me finish with reminding you on uh, checking for updates on quantumscienceseminar.com. And with this, we say goodbye, everyone, for now. See you next time.